Andrea Vega. I picked a kelp and urchin issue because of my initial interest with coral reefs. I was kind of asking myself, how is it possible that there are two great big ecosystems and they are both in trouble? So I wanted to see what I could do in order to help and better understand our ocean. I've been living in California since I was six years old, and I've logged in over a hundred dives in the kelp forest in Monterey Bay. These beautiful, highly diverse ecosystems are so important to the ecology of the bay. And the people who live along it rely on it so heavily as well. And so I, it was devastating to see them getting wiped out by these massive grazing of urchins. And so when I joined this class and I saw this opportunity, I grabbed it immediately. Hi, I'm Sri Ramesh. And I initially started working on this problem because I am horrified by climate change and the loss of habitat and wildlife around the globe. And so as a computer science student, when I started looking around as ways that I could try and help to combat this problem, I found that there was not a lot of interest in my field for these types of problems. And so I thought it was really important that I try and find ways to bridge this gap, to bring computer science solutions to the conservation space. And while we didn't end up going towards a computer science oriented solution in the end, I thought it was really important that I stuck with the problem to the end. Kelp forests are home to an incredible amount of diverse sets of plants and animals. Around 25% of marine life can be found in this ecosystem. Across the world, kelp forests are quickly turning into urchin barrens, and this calls for a sense of urgency. A quote from Nora Eddy states the following, Imagine California without trees. Can you imagine large swaths of the Sierra gone in just a matter of years? This is exactly what is happening. Working on this issue for the past nine weeks emphasized the level of concern that should be given to this issue. As a team, we are honored to have explored this issue and made the connections within the community. We are the Kelp and Urchin team. For nine weeks, we focused on the issue created by purple sea urchins over grazing kelp forests and we broke up our journey up into four different phases. For phase one, um, we focused on understanding the problem at hand. During our first few weeks of research and solution exploration, we came up with new hypotheses almost as fast as we pivoted them. We entertained the idea of education, but we knew it wouldn't be as proactive as we'd like it to be and wouldn't give us an immediate result, which is what we were looking for. And we also ventured into a possible partnership with coastal communities impacted by coastal erosion, but we weren't able to use their struggle as an incentive to encourage kelp restoration because of the fall, falling short of supporters and hard facts to support what we wanted to do with that. Through our interviews, new questions emerged and we decided to focus on the experiences of the people already involved. And this takes us into phase two. So during both phase one and phase two, we were doing background research to make sure, uh, to just get a better feel for what people in the problem space are already doing. And throughout phase one, and really what led us into phase two is we ended up finding out that a lot of people ended up doing things really inefficiently. Um, for example, Tom Ford with the Bay Foundation considered in California one of the more successful um, kelp forest restoration efforts uh, said that they basically just take divers and have to go out and crush urchins by hand. So we imagine, he said in the interview, just like going out with a hammer and counting one, two, three, four, up to four million urchins, which is how much they've gotten so far. It's a lot of time. And despite all of that, they've only really covered about the area of a small college campus, which is, which is not a lot in the grand scheme of things. So we really uh, shifted and we thought that we have to find some way of making this faster, cheaper, easier. So we swapped to um, finding, compiling a different list of these possible ways of making things more efficient. We went from as high tech as t thinking of like an autonomous ROV that could um, use machine learning to pick out specifically purple urchins and smash them all the way down to things as low tech as a uh, net trap that you could bait with vegetables. It, while this took a lot of time, um, it was a lot of just this sort of comp compilation research, um, making sure that the list was as tight as we could get. Phase three was a lot more about getting into the nitty gritty to sort out which of these solutions would be the best? And it involved like looking into the costs of these things, what would deployment be like, um, 
do they require extensive development time, things like that. And along the way, in the sort of middle phase between phase two and phase three, we ended up having a bit of a transition where before we were sort of thinking about everything and sort of just like, a, what would help the general effort or like organizations interested in this topic? And um, through this, we started to narrow down more and more and think about really what would help the urchin divers, the fishers with, the, with these licenses who fish urchins, what would really help them? Um, and so next slide, turns out, uh, one of the interviews we did was with Jeff, two Jeffs, Jeff, um, Jeff Baldwin and Jeff Matson. Uh, they're really good at what they can do. Um, 5,000 urchins in two to three hours is a lot of urchins. Um, so suddenly that just raised the bar dramatically of the kinds of things that these solutions that we were designing had to compete with. Um, and much more of these like higher tech solutions, the drones, the, we had like a boat mounted machine. Um, they, to compete with that level of efficiency, they would end up becoming very, very expensive. And so more and more traps really started to become the way to go. Um, and so we uh, had some more interviews, checking with a bunch of different people, seeing what they thought about it. And we got a lot of positive, um, feedback and positive outlooks on it. A lot of people were really into the idea of using traps uh, to solve this problem. And as we started to get all of this like positive reinforcement, a little bit of a creeping doubt started to come in. Uh, like if traps were so good and they, I mean, they supposedly are, why had we thought of them before? Turns out, <laughs> We're on, as this wonderful comic says, Mount Stupid, more scientifically known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's what happens when you don't know how much you don't know. So you think that you've gotten the whole span, like you think you know a lot, but you don't. Um, turns out traps are illegal for commercial urchin fishing, restoration efforts included. So uh, we kind of hit a wall and we had to completely reframe how we wanted to think about this um and it yeah the demand was clearly still there so it was really a matter of trying to find out how or what our relationship with the regulations were going to be which brings us to phase four so phase four was kind of setting up these traps um to use in a kind of scientific project to really test the strengths and weaknesses of the traps as well as the benefits to the ecosystem of actually cha changing policies to allow other methods and also increase the amount of of catch so it kind of becomes in part of our traps useful as well as changing those policies and so by using those traps we want to show that they are an effective and efficient way to kind of help remove those urchins, help out with the commercial fishers who want to, who also want to help remove the urchins and the restoration groups who might want them as a piece that they can use to passively remove the urchins while they have their own divers out collecting others. And to do that, we'd have to convince the California Fish and Game Commission, who actually creates these policies, and those are enforced through the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so we want to kind of get a scientific collection permit which would allow us to run our our study uh, and hopefully with that data we can show it's sufficient enough to kind of promote a regulatory change um, for sea urchin removal next slide so this it kind of splits into a three-step plan so first in part one is of course we have to get the money and we we did have an interview with jake who talked to the class a few weeks ago about grants and we kind of learned that grants can be difficult and mainly we go through philanthro philip i don't know that word very well but go through grants like that um yes those <laughs> starting with the uh, micro grants are a good way to go because by getting those it kind of builds the confidence of bigger grant gi uh, gifters and so one grant that we're looking at which can count as a micro grant would be like the Friends of Long Marine Lab. Another way we were thinking of getting money is also crowdfunding like sites like GoFundMe and things like that for people who would want to donate. 
And then we also had kind of a deal that we set where we could sell those urchins that we catch in our traps to a lab at San Diego State University um, for about, uh, well, X amount per urchin. The second part is coming up with the actual scientific proposal and obtaining that scientific permit. So like the grant, we would be doing a grant, a proposal similar to a grant, but more on the scientific side, just to kind of convince the people who would give the scientific permit that this is a good thing to do. And so we lay out our, our strategy for performing the, the study and what we would do with those results, which in this case would be giving them to the Fish and Game Commission after writing a scientific paper and trying to convince those policy changes. And last, of course, is part three, which is actually going through the, the, going through the study, where kind of a breakdown on this would be you'd study the area before the traps were, de uh, were deployed just to kind of get a lay of the health of the ecosystem. And then we would kind of split that into a grid and deploy traps for the amount of time that the, the best amount of time to soak them um, and kind of do that for a couple of months until we've cleared enough urchins. And then during that, the time that the traps are there, we would have uh, more surveys just to see what's actually going down on under the water with, uh, are they urchins climbing on? Is there any bycatch coming and things like that. And throughout this, we'd be also collecting spores just to see if the, if there's no spores, there's no kelp. So if, if that ends up being a thing, then that creates a bit of problem for the restoration, but it is our test area as we're going to show in the next is a spot where there is a known kelp forest. And so the main important part for the restoration is a year later, we would actually go back and see if spores, uh, sporophytes have settled, if kelp is starting to grow and if the urchins had come back. Okay, now next slide. So our study area that we want to do is the Carmel Bay State Marine Conservation Area, which is actually where that video of the fish swimming up all the rocks and the urchins was taken. Um, it's a great spot because it's easy to access. You can um, for the traps, it's great, easy to get there by boat, and then for the divers needed, they can just swim out from the shore to do those surveys while the traps are in, and the post survey later on. One big thing is that a lot of it's being turned has been turned into an urchin barren. Um, there's still some kelp left, but most of it's been uh, wiped out. And another thing is it has a huge depth range. It can go from 10 feet to 60 feet in a short distance, so we can test the effects of traps at different depths. The only con on this is that it is a state marine conservation area, so we definitely need that scientific permit to even go out and grab any of them. Final slide. And so I know our team is excited about this. I'm personally excited. These people are all the ones who are excited. One of my favorite quotes was from uh, Jeff Baldwin who yelled, let's take out our boats and make some money. That was back at the initial point where we were working on fisheries, but he's, they still want to help out and they would even offer it at some point to participate with the trap deployment themselves. And these are just all the others who are excited. So with that, we have the confidence that we think that we can move forward with this and that we will be successful.